I mean, you know that the enemy, he, he's sly, but he's not smart. Amen. Uh, this morning, I want to talk to you about casting that thing. Turn to your neighbors and neighbor. Cast that thing. Turn to the other side. Say, neighbor. Pastor said, cast that thing. Cast that thing. Over in Mark chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus, the text says, and he said unto them, take heed what he hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you and unto you that here shall more be given. The NIV translation it reads like this. The text says, consider carefully what you hear. The Amplified reads like this. And he said to them, be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you. Jesus says, be careful for what you hear. He says, because what you hear is going to come back to you. So Jesus is telling his disciples and he's talking to us this morning. He's instructing us to protect ourselves from ungodly, non-biblical information. The enemy is using the media like never before to shape us. This, just bear with me for just a few minutes. Let me just get some information out to you, some factual information as I go into this, this teaching. In 1973, there were only three network stations, CBS, NBC, and ABC. Anybody remember that? And if you remember, the transmitters were shut off at 12 o'clock midnight. And they will let you know that the transmitters were getting ready to get shut off because they would play the national anthem. And once you start hearing the national anthem, you knew that was it. It was over. And after the na national anthem, the screen was static. White fuzz. Anybody remember that? <laughs> and the FCC was doing their job at the time because during that time the FCC would not allow any uh, vulgar language to come across the screen. There were no um, sex scenes. The material was clean. Commercials were clean. There's some commercials I just, I can't even watch. A commercial now. Uh, what was being broadcast into our homes was so regulated that Dick Van Dyke, remember the big Dick Van Dyke show? They slept in separate beds, twin beds, remember that? And then comes the rise of cable. In 1989, cable hits the scene you have maybe about 50 to 53 million households that were able to afford cable. Your suburbs, your middle class. Not at my house, you know, we wouldn't get no cable. Um, but by 1992, you had roughly 60% of American households with cable. Now today, as I speak, 
you have majority of the households in America that have access to over 200 plus channels at the flick of a switch, unregulated, unfiltered. We have all this stuff spewing into our homes. And the enemy is using media to shape the thought process of people. The devil's after your thought process. The devil is after your thinking. He's after your mind. One of the basic elementary principles of spiritual warfare is to understand that the battle, the spiritual battle, is in the mind. The media is the vehicle between the source and the audience. The source and the audience, media is the middleman. Say I'm the source, you're the audience. I'm gonna use a media to get information to you to shape your thinking. Media is the communication outlet, radio, television, advertisement, print, whether it's books or magazines, movies. The Latin word for media is medium, is where you get all the information through a medium. If you remember correctly, you read back in the Old Testament, back in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, back in those books, God judged mediums. False prophets, sorcery. He, he, he cursed and he went after ungodly mediums. Today we have ungodly mediums. And the reason God went after them in the Old Testament is because they were misleading people away from him and giving them wrong information about who he was and what his agenda was. It's no different now. But we have mediums now through radio, television, books. Remember Ephesians. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, principalities and powers. So we have all these forces working behind these mediums. Jesus, when he first came on the scene in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus, when he first stopped preaching, remember when he hit the scene, there was 400 years of silence. God had not spoken to man for 400 years. No prophecies, nothing, no word, nothing from God for 400 years. And then until Jesus hits the scene, and Jesus hits the scene, and his first sermon was repent. Repent means change your mind. Change your mind. That's what repent means. Jesus was telling them after 400 years, change your mind. You've been doing all this idol worship. You've been dealing with all of this, these Pharisees and Sadducees and all this tradition of man that makes the power of God of none effect. Change your mind. Repent. The Apostle Paul, he says it a little differently over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul puts it like this, beginning with verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5, Paul says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought 
to the obedience of Christ. Now, let me read you those same verses out of the New Living Translation. Verse 3, the text says, we are human, but we don't war as humans do. Verse 4, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. Now watch this. Any medium that brings information to us that is in conflict with God's word, whether it's television, books, advertisement, movies, whatever the medium might be, if it brings a conflict to God's word, it's a false argument. Eight people got it. Any medium, whether it's television, movies, books, magazines, that brings conflict with the word of God, that is in direct conflict with the word, that says one thing contrary to the word, it's a false argument. Amen. Paul calls it a stronghold. What's a stronghold? It's a lie that is believed. He said, cast that down. He says in verse 5, he says, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Paul is saying, we are to capture rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Now, how do we do this? By becoming, watch this, by becoming a medium or a vehicle of true godly information Amen. to counter the rebellious information. Yeah. To you, the only way to counter false information is to give out correct information. Yeah. Here lies the challenge of the church and God's people. We have been challenged in casting down ungodly media information. See, I was a marketing major, business and marketing major, and uh, the advertising agencies, they know that if they keep advertising a certain product over and over again, eventually you're going to buy into it. Eventually you're going to try it. Because it's going to get into your psychic, your subconscious mind. And eventually they know that you're going to buy into it. The devil knows that if, they, if, if he keeps playing rebellious information through, through media, that eventually you're going to hear it and see it so much that it's going to become normal to you. That's the goal, to make it normal to you. And it's all disguised behind entertainment. I'm going somewhere. The world is not trying to entertain you. The world is trying to shape you through its agenda. And as Christians, we are obligated, we are mandated to know the difference. When we stop casting down and bringing in obedience these thoughts and these suggestions that come through these mediums, it affects us. That's why Jesus says, be careful how you hear. Amen. 
see these shows that just become this television shows that maybe I watch and maybe I don't watch. But that's not how the enemy sees it. He knows that if you see enough of this over and over and over and over again, you accept it as normal. It's not normal. Well, Pastor, that's how you know? I got the text. I have truth to counter a rebellious lie. Now, I'm not trying to be political. I'm not trying to make a, a statement. I'm, I'm trying to help God's people with the thinking process and casting down these suggestions and thoughts that hit our minds. Because when we stop casting down ungodly thoughts, normally two things happen. First, one of the things that happens is we become pessimistic about our situations, about life, about our future. We just see everything just gloom and doom. See, if you turn on news and everything now, you just think that everything is just, just, just awful. That, you know, it's just, it's just awful. I, I wonder what they would have thought had they had television during the Civil War. You see where I'm going with this? Is it really as bad as it was? As I mean, is it as bad as it could be? Or is it as bad as the enemy wants you to perceive to depress you and oppress you? And when we don't cast down these ungodly suggestions and, and thoughts, we become pessimistic about our future, about our goals, about our dreams. Uh, Psalms 27, verse 13 through verse 14, New Living Translation. And this is, this is David. He says, yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. Verse 14, David says, wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. David was saying, I am confident that I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord on this side. See, when we stop casting down these thoughts that come at us through these mediums, we start thinking that, you know, life is just really going bad, situations are going bad, and things are just bad, and we just get sucked up in this black vacuum. And I'm here to tell you this morning, you simply have to just turn this stuff off, cast that stuff down, and live the abundant life. Protect your thought process, protect your peace, and be available to minister to those who don't know better. Amen. The Bible says we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. In other words, we are not ignorant of his schemes and how he operates. He's operating the same way he was operating back in Genesis. Nothing new, just the same old program. And we understand his program. But if we buy into what the media is feeding us, these mediums are feeding us, then we will go down like the rest of the world in our thought process. I don't know about you, but I am determined to win the battle in my mind over this situation, over these circumstances. I mean, if you simply were to just take you a piece of paper and write down on a piece of paper everything that God has done for you, Everything you can think of that God, God has done for you and compare it to the small things that may not be going your way, that enough is enough to shape your mind to realize, you know what, I need to get my head up out of the sand. <laughs> I need to snap out of this. I need to give God some praise. Because the truth is, he's better than what we realize. He's been good to us more than what we realize. He's watched over us more than what we realize. He's blessed us more than what we give him credit for. You know he's good. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. We have to defend our mind against unscriptural, unsound information that are coming through these mediums. 
And it's the second thing where we stop casting down ungodly thoughts. We stop trusting God in the difficult times. Because we have allowed the enemy to convince us that this is how it is. And this is how it's going to play out. Well, again, that may be how it's going to play out in my neighbor's household. But it ain't going to play that way in my household. Because I'm like Joshua. As for me and my house, <laughs> we're going to serve the Lord. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. <laughs> Psalm 16, verse 1 and verse 2, NIV translation. The text says, and this is David. He says, keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. David said, I, I take refuge in you, God. And apart from you, I don't have anything that's good. And I, I can feel David. I'm like, David, if, apart from God, I don't have nothing. If I don't have Jesus, I ain't got nothing. If I don't have Jesus, car keys don't mean nothing. If I don't have Jesus, house key don't mean nothing. If I don't have Jesus, relationship doesn't mean anything. If I don't have Jesus, job does not mean anything. If I don't have Jesus. And I'm trying to tell you this morning, as a born-again, blood-bought believer, if you don't have Jesus, everything else is irrelevant. Romans chapter 5 verse 3 New Living Translation the text says we can rejoice too we can run into problems and trials but we know that they help us develop endurance this text is saying that we can rejoice and not run away from but embrace the trials that may come our way and not allow our minds to wonder because we understand that in spite of it we are growing stronger and stronger in the Lord our God Amen, Amen somebody what are you saying, Pastor Deck? I'm simply trying to say, don't allow your mind to wonder. Don't allow your mind to just wander off. Control your thought process. See, because if you allow your mind to go where it wants to go, it'll take you places you shouldn't be. Amen, somebody. I remember when I, I was growing up, I was a little boy, and I used to get up early. I mean, I, I get up early and be gone all day. On a Saturday, I'm up. When I say early, I'm like six o'clock. I'm up, I'm gone. My siblings and my mother, they knew he, he's out, he's just out. And back then you could do that and know where, and know that you're gonna get home for dinner. I don't know you can do that now. But I get up and I, I'm out. And I had no agenda. Wasn't going to see nobody. I had no money. I ain't but eight, nine. I'm just going. I'm just walking. And whoever was out, I'll speak to them, stick my hand in the stores. So everybody knew me. It could be a little nappy head boy again. I'm just wondering. Next thing I know, I'm like 15, 16 blocks away from home. I just, I'm just wondering. I come on, where you been? Oh, nowhere. Just walking. Just wondering. That's what the devil wants to do with your mind. He wants to get into your thought process and get you to start just wondering through scenarios and what ifs and what if this happens and what if this doesn't happen and what if they do and what if they don't. Just, just, just wondering. And so now you all worked up. You're filling with, filled with anxiety and, and, and despair over stuff that has not happened. Yeah. Probably ain't not going to happen. But it's all your what ifs. And how comes. And maybes. And so now your mind is consumed with all this warfare that the enemy has been throwing at your mind when you simply could have said you know what I'm not you're not going there yeah. 
Sometimes you got to tell your mind, I'm not going there. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself and tell your thought process, you know what, we're not focusing on that right now. We're not going to worry about that right now. We can't change that right now. Come back. We're going to go this way. I mean, no, you got to talk to yourself. You got to direct your mind. You got to direct your perception about life. Don't allow outside mediums to direct your focus. Enemy loves to break your focus. And when he breaks your focus, watch this. You, you can't, you, 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 you're not successful in what you want to do for yourself. You're not successful for what you want to do for God because the enemy has you busy worrying and working on what ifs and scenarios in your mind. And for those who don't know how to control, they had to end up taking medication, they had to end up taking counsel, and I'm not against that. I'm not, I'm not trying to talk down on that. I'm si simply saying, you can guard against that. Amen, Amen somebody. Watch this. The God that you and I serve, the text says that God is immutable. He's immutable. Immutable means he cannot change. I said, God cannot change. Malachi chapter 3, 16, he says, for I am the Lord, I change not. Everything changes, but God does not change. The weather changes. Folks in office change. Jobs change. Relationships change. The weather changes, but God does not change. He is consistently constant in everything he does in his interacting with us. And so your Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, watch this now. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Why you read that, Pastor Doug? I read that to you for you to understand that God cannot change this verse. He's immutable. He cannot change this verse. So, Doug, if you ask anything according to my will, son, I hear you. If you ask anything according to his will, he hears you. What am I saying? I'm simply saying that we have to control our thought process whereby if we find ourselves struggling in our psyche, we find ourselves struggling in our situations, we simply don't have to allow our minds to wonder. All we have to do is go to the one who knows. Go to the one who has the answers because he says, he's, you know what? He says, if you pray according to his will, he hears you. He's immutable. He, ha he does not change. He does not change. Now what can help us with controlling ungodly information? Um, full disclosure. Full disclosure. I was um I was watching a movie, or I attempted to watch a movie. It was um, a, a true story. The movie was based on a true story, and I like to watch true stuff, you know. I, and so, because it was based on a true story, I, I thought, well, maybe this see what's, if I can glean something from this. And um, I got maybe 10, 15 minutes into that movie. And um, I start feeling dirty. I start feeling like I needed a bath. I turn that thing off. My mind starts feeling heavy. And I start feeling unclean. And I turn that thing off. And I'm sitting there like, man, why did I? Why did I give 20 minutes of myself to that? And I heard the Holy Spirit say, cast that thing. And I cast that thing off of me. Because I got sucked into something that was a true story 
that was something I thought would be informative. And at the while, that thing tried to suck me into a dark area. And I had to cast that thing. But how I many know the movie was, it was good. But the Holy Spirit was sensitive enough to get my attention. You need to turn this. See, sometimes, watch this, sometimes we're watching stuff that in our mind we think, oh, well, it's not that bad. It's, you know, it, 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 ain't, it, ain't, it ain't not that bad. And we start watching it and it, it gets good as a good plot. But we're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit and we keep going in deeper. But we got to be able to pull out or not even go there in the first place. I had no business going there. I'm the pastor. I'm like, Bishop, what you doing up in here? Yeah. Evangelist. <laughs> Whatever title. I, I, what's my title? Whatever my title is. I ain't got no business going through there no way. But it was, my point, it, it was innocent. I had no intention of, of looking at anything that would grieve the Holy Spirit. I had nothing, I had no intention of watching anything that I thought would uh, uh, be upsetting to the Holy Spirit. It, it, it started out clean. It started out okay. It, it was based on a true story. It was, and then after a while, it just turned. But thank God I had the Holy Spirit to say, pull up out of here. Back up. Redirect. How I many know sometimes we got to listen to the Holy Ghost and when the Holy Ghost says back up, redirect, you got to back up, redirect, turn it off. Don't try to justify. Don't try to get the last plot. Don't say it's okay. No, back up out of there. And some of you this morning, you watching stuff. You got mediums coming into your home. You got your kids acting a certain way. And you got your teenagers acting a certain way. Your young adults acting a certain way. That's because they don't got sucked in to these dark mediums. And the Holy Spirit said, back up out of that. Back up out of that. Don't go down that road. Don't go down that road. So what help us control ourselves and this ungodly information? Ask the Holy Spirit to give you better thoughts. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you better thoughts. There are two kinds of mindsets. The old nature and the Holy Spirit. And you and I have to choose between the two. We have to choose. We have to choose the mindset that we're going to operate in. Romans chapter 8 verse 5 and verse 6, New Living Translation. Verse 5, the text says, those who are dominated by sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. My sinful nature was saying, watch that. Go ahead and get that next plot. But the Holy Spirit was saying, back up out of that. You hear me? My flesh was saying, oh, it's all right. Based on a true story. It's history. I mean, it happened. You ain't got to turn it. The Holy Spirit said, back up out of that. Verse 6, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Watch this. Each mindset brings a different result. Had I sat there and pretend like the Holy Spirit was not nudging me, the next time I will become a little less sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And then the next time a little less sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. To uh, eventually, I wouldn't even hear the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And that's a challenge for some of us this morning. Some of us, we have the Holy Spirit with us and within us, but we become numb to his prompting because we have been ignoring him for so long that we're not, we have become desensitized to the spirit of God. 
This nation has become desensitized to the spirit of God. And that's not good. Because just claiming to be a Christian and not conducting yourself as a Christian leads to bad results. And these are folks who are making decisions for the nation. They got their fingers on the nukes. They determine who go to war, who doesn't go to war. What we spend and what we shouldn't spend. Uh, I, mm. All ungodly thoughts or suggestions appeal to our weaknesses. You hear me? They come to appeal to the weakness of the flesh. And if your flesh is stronger than your spirit, man, then you're going to give in to your flesh and you're going to become deeper into what the agenda is and that is for you to become, to accept everything as normal. So there must be a rejection and a replace of the false with the truth. I replace and reject the false and I replace it with truth. How do I do that? I simply pull back out and say, no, no, that's a lie. I'm going back towards the word. I'm embracing the word. And then the second thing is this, I'm almost done. My thought life and your thought life needs to have a daily cleansing and a daily refocusing we are feeling what we think we are getting what we think the Bible teaches this the Bible teaches that the way you act is determined by the way you feel and the way you feel is determined by the way you think that's scriptural that's the word so you and I, our thought process must go through this daily cleansing. Watch this. We all have a physical cleansing. We get up in the morning, we take a, a shower, right? We wash our physical bodies and we brush our teeth, we comb our hair. We, every day we have a cleansing of the physical body. Every day, all, all truth is parallel as it is in the natural, it is in the spirit. Your spirit man has to have a daily cleansing through the word. Psalms 119 verse 165 NIV translation the text says great peace have they who love your law and nothing can make them stumble yeah. watch this now just the word alone will deliver and save your mind just the word alone just the word alone can give you peace Great peace have they who love my law. Some of you this morning need some peace. You say, Pat, if I can just get some peace, if I can just get up out of this house and get some peace, I'm telling you, if you get the word of God into your spirit, you can sit right there in the midst of the chaos and not be moved. You can sit right there in the midst of the problems and not be moved. Why? Because a word alone is enough to anchor your soul down in the presence of God. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. The word alone is enough to keep you from stumbling. Yeah. Keep you from tripping. Psalms 119 verse 130. The text says the entrance of thy words give light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. The entrance of thy words give it light. It gives understanding to the simple. What does that mean? It simply means when I find my thought process, I find my physical position in a place of darkness, it is the word that I embrace that will give me light in that place of darkness. Whether it's my physical place or whether it's my thinking, it is the word that will light up that situation. Amen, somebody. Three things. I'm, I'm done. Three things. To help your mental state. And make it easier for you for casting things down. First one is this. Think about Jesus. I immediately thought about Jesus 
when the Holy Spirit said, cast that thing down, I immediately thought about hurting the heart of Jesus because I recognized that the Lord is with me wherever I go. And I'm thinking, I made him watch 15 minutes of this stuff. Lord, I'm sorry. Immediately think about Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, the contemporary English verse in the text says, keep your mind on Jesus. I mean, no, that's the easiest thing to do, just keep your mind on the Lord. And then the second thing is this. Think about eternity. Think about eternity. You know, oftentimes, a lot of us don't think about eternity until we go to a home going. It's not until we're actually seeing someone transition, or someone who's transitioned, that we start thinking about heaven. When really, it should be a part of our everyday thought process and our everyday embracing. See, if I were to tell you that, I'm going to give you a round trip vacation to, let's say, um, Rome. And I buy you the tickets, place them in your hand, and you know within a few months you're going to Rome. I got the tickets. They've been paid for. I'm going to Rome. How many days do you think you would tra think about that trip and talk about it before you went to Rome? Every day you probably tell somebody, oh, girl, I'm going to Rome. You ain't going to Rome. I got the tickets. I'm going to Rome. Been paid for. You start preparing for Rome. When you go shopping, I wonder how that look over in Italy. Why? Because your expectation is on your next destination. Yeah. I may be weird like this, I don't know. I may be weird like this. But every day, I think about eternity. Every day, I think about the transition period and what it's going to be like. I think about my loved ones. I think about those who have not yet made that decision. But it's a constant thought. And I'm telling you this morning, it will help you with casting down ungodly information that come through ungodly mediums. When you keep in mind, not where you are, but where you're headed. And then the third thing is this, and I'm done. That is, when you're casting down those high things, what helps you do that is to think about other people. I didn't read the scripture. The text says this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, the Living Bible translation, the text says this. Don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too, and in what they're doing. What helps me cast down those ungodly thoughts and impressions is that not only am I thinking about Jesus, not only am I thinking about my next destination, but I'm thinking about those who are so closely tied to me that I can affect. If I stumble 
what would happen to my boys? If I stumble, what would happen to my wife? If I stumble, what would happen to my girls? If I stumble, what would happen to God's people? If I stumble, if I allow the enemy to feed my flesh and I ignore the spirit man, And he calls me to stumble. What would happen to those connected to me? The next time you're in a situation like that, when the enemy is challenging your, your, your thought process and you're going after stuff that's coming through an ungodly medium and you think it's just going to be okay, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's not you know, really anything serious, it's not that big of a deal. Think about those connected to you. What if it causes you to stumble? How would they be affected? You have to be, we have to be a, a pillar of truth. When everything else is around us is a rebellious lie that's contradicting the word of God. If we can't cast it down with our words or cast it down with our thought process, we can cast it down with our actions. See, there's some things as a pastor I have to be very careful about what I say because we're in a different climate. But some things I don't need to say. I can demonstrate my position by my actions. Don't allow the enemy to cause you to become normal cast that thing some of you have been watching stuff cast that thing some of you have been reading stuff cast that thing some of you on the social media Commenting, taking in comments, laughing, giggling. Cast that thing. We are the standard barriers. <laughs> we don't have to fight with words, we fight with our position. And we let our light shine in the midst of darkness. So when darkness tries to show up, when the lie tries to stand, there you stand as light and truth. So now other folks have a choice. They have a choice now. I see darkness, I see light. Now they can choose. But if it's all gray, if it all blends together, if it all looks the same, if it all flows the same, if it all sounds the same, if it all functions the same, if it all rolls the same, you know the old saying, if it cracked like a duck, if it walked like a duck, if it looked like a duck, most likely it's a duck. No, no. Ask me who I am. I'm not going to tell you where I work. I'm not going to give you my name. I'm going to tell you I'm a child of the Most High God. Come on, give him a praise. Come on, give him a praise. Children of the Most High God. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Arababo shaka. I heard somebody tell me, somebody tell me lately, they, it's, it's tough being a Christian. I said, I beg the different. I don't think it's tough being a Christian. I think it's an honor being a Christian. I wear it as a badge of honor. Hallelujah, somebody. Father, we bless you. We honor you this morning. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to share in your word. Father, we thank you for the people of God. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in their lives and in their homes, in the lives of their families and their children, God. Father, we pray that you would continue, Lord, to lead God and direct them. Lord, we pray that you would continue to strengthen them, that they can stand for what is right, that they can stand for righteousness, and that they will continue to be that pillar of strength in a culture of weakness. My Father, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, put those hands together. This morning, I want to pray with everyone the prayer of salvation. I recognize that there may be some here this morning who have not yet made Jesus Christ their personal Lord and Savior. And uh, I want to pray with you this morning. But what I want is for everyone, if you would, to, to join in with me. Um, I recognize that you, you may have given your life to Christ, but it's okay to rededicate your life. How many know that rededication is a good thing? And so I want everyone, if you're watching on YouTube, I want you to pray with me. I want to lead you into a prayer of salvation. So repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you forgive me of all of my sins. I truly believe that Jesus Christ is your son who suffered on the cross and died, went to hell, and on the third day was raised from the dead. And he's now seated at your right hand, praying for me that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Father, I'm asking for Jesus Christ to come into my life, to come into my heart, and to be my personal Lord and Savior. Now, Father, by faith, I believe that I'm saved, that I'm born again, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Come on, give him a praise. Listen, if you pray that prayer for the first time, we want to know about it. If you're out there listening and watching on YouTube, we want to know about it. Contact us. There's some information on the screen. We want to know about it. We want to celebrate with you. If you're present and you pray that prayer for the first time, let us know. Let one of us just know so we can celebrate with you. Amen. Amen. Well, are you ready to worship the Lord in your giving? Okay. Amen. Wasn't that a good word? Amen. I am, uh, man, that was a good word. I am thoroughly impressed with Pastor, Doug, Pastor Doug's uh, knowledge of pop, pop culture. When he started off with Andy Griffith and uh, the Beverly Hillbillies, the whole room was with him. But when he went over to the to deeper into pop culture with uh, Pose, I think he lost most of y'all, except the 80 year old elder up in the church. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Uh, it's good to be back in front of a live audience, but forgive me if I. Uh, Sound like I'm talking to the screen because I know there are people out there watching. And uh, I want to remind everyone that we have several ways to give. Uh, it's on your screen. But I want to especially remind everyone that we're still doing the uh, missions work over in Africa with uh, 
Ethiopia now because of Kennedy. Also with Haiti, uh, we're still doing that. So for those of you who are in the car right now or those of you who are watching at home and you want to give toward the missions, you can text uh, missions or you can go to the uh, website and uh, give that way. Amen. If you would please turn with me over to Malachi, <clears throat> the third chapter. Amen. And uh, Pastor Doug quoted this, uh, this one scripture. He started off with uh, verse 6. He says, For I am the Lord thy God, and I do not change. Amen. And then I'm going to drop down to uh, verse 8. And before I get there, I'm, I'm uh, talking to those who ever partner with anyone in business or who's, who's ever gone into a, a business venture and it went south or things didn't go quite the way it was supposed to, meaning you didn't get your money. <laughs> Amen. And uh, over in uh, Malachi, the, the uh, third chapter, in the eighth verse, it says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? And this was written back uh, when the society was an a agrarian society. I mean, they will, they will plant and then they would harvest and then they would uh, store. And uh, God is asking for part of that harvest. Amen. And he said to them, now you, you're robbing me if you don't give me an offering. He said, how have I robbed you? Well, we partnered together. You planted the seeds, you uh, picked the crop, but I provided the soil, I provided the sun, I provided the rain, where's my portion? And I know you're thinking, well, we, we, don't, we don't plant anymore, but God has given you over in uh, Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, I have given you the ability to get wealth. Amen. Uh, I've, I've given you the brain. I've given you, uh, for you real estate agents out there, I provide the houses and the land. Amen. For those of you who say, uh, who, who are artistic and work with your hands, I've given you that ability. Where is my portion? So I know you put in the hours, but God is giving you the ability to get that wealth. And all he's asking for, he's not saying 50-50. He's not saying 60-40 or 70-30. He's asking for 10% at a minimum. That is a sliver. Think about that. You get, hey amen, <clears throat> you get a dollar, you get to keep 90 cents. All he's asking for is a dime. One lousy dime, hey amen. And when you think of it in grand, grand scope, it's not a lot. Hey amen, for all that he's done for you. Uh, as, as, as I just said, if you don't do anything else for me, he's already done enough, hey amen. So all he's asking for is a portion, hey amen. And he says, uh, now, well, I don't think giving is a heaven or a hell issue, right, man? But the Bible says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Amen. We was in a meeting uh, this week, and somebody said, "Can I dance back up to, to the, uh, to the, to the, to give my offering?" <laughs> Pastor Zuck said, "Amen. Go ahead." God loves a cheerful giver. But oh, now, on the other side of that, what does he think about those who don't give, who don't give cheerfully? I'll let you I'll let that marinate. Uh, we have the ushers go ahead and come for those of you. Well, at home, you can go ahead and prepare your offerings out in the car. Amen. Everyone given who uh, desires to give. 
Amen. So I'm going to ask you to point your hand toward the offering. For those of you at home, you can raise your offering up or point towards the screen or your radio. We're going to use that as a point of contact. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that went forth today. Heavenly Father, we thank you right now for this opportunity to sow into your kingdom, dear God. And we thank you, dear God, because of our obedience, dear God, that there is a blessing, Heavenly Father, in store for us, dear God. We pray and ask that you bless those who gave, dear God. Bless the receiver, dear God. Bless and multiply. Heavenly Father, I pray and ask that because of their obedience, that they lack no good thing, dear God. Meet them at their point of need, dear God. I pray for uh, jobs, contracts, whatever the need may be, dear God. Bless them, dear God, in Jesus' name. Dear God, for Harvest Rain Church, I thank you, dear God. But this allows us to continue your vision, dear God. We thank you for this provision, dear God. We thank you that because of their obedience, dear God, the lives will be touched, changed, and the Father's souls will be saved, dear God. We thank you. We praise you. We bless you. In your son Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Praise God. Amen.